I'm going to ask you to please stand as we read God's Word. If you have your copy of God's Word, if it's on the screen, we won't read the entire passage. We're going to read beginning in Matthew 8, verse 23. Matthew 8, 23, And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep, and they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? O you of little faith. Then he rose, then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this? that even winds and sea obey him. Chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus, you are the authority, the only authority. We worship you, we celebrate you, we praise you today. Father, there are people here who need you to heal them spiritually. They need a brand new heart. And you're the only one who can do that. So Lord, we pray today is that day that they would repent of their sin, they would acknowledge their sin, they would confess their sin, and they would turn to you. Father, as our children go to children's church, I pray that you would bless Anila as she proclaims your truth. And I pray for kids who need to have a brand new heart. That today is the day of salvation. I pray for their parents. That their parents would teach your word each and every day in their homes. And that their kids would hear from their parents, their moms, their dads about you. Father, thank you for what you're doing in the life of this congregation Thank you for the time of prayer we had earlier today. May we continually be in an attitude of prayer, celebrating your authority and your power. And we ask these things in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Our main passage is today is Matthew 8, 23. Going through chapter 9, verse 13, I will not read the entire passage, but we will touch on each one of the miracles. As we talked about last week, we talked about the authority of Jesus Christ. And these miracles display that authority. These miracles also display that He truly is the Son of God, that He is far more than just a man. That He is the Messiah, the Chosen One. And as we read and focus on these miracles today, that theme will continue. But also we'll be reminded of some of His specific authority over specific things, specific parts of this world, and even the spirit world. But these miracles, they point to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That He was not only man, but He also was God And is God. His authority was on full display when he told them in these miracles and ones last week we read, and even the the last one that we'll read today or focus on today, that his ultimate miracle is a spiritual renewal in people's lives, changing their hearts, giving them a brand new life, and then by his authority telling them to follow me. Because his ultimate purpose was to make disciples of all nations. His ultimate purpose was then to have those disciples go out and in turn make disciples of all nations. That was his very purpose. But in Matthew 8, 23 and following, 
We begin by noticing in verse 23 that he had authority over the weather. He had just finished three or four miracles that we talked about last week. He was exhausted. He was physically tired. He had just finished the Sermon on the Mount. So they get in the boat. They go across the lake, uh, the Sea of Galilee. And it tells us in this account that he is fast asleep. But it also tells us there's a major storm. Now the context here is that some of the disciples were professional fishermen. I mean, they had been through storms before because they had been on that lake probably their entire adult life, if not much of their teenage lives, learning how to be a fisherman. Well, this one so frightened them that in the context of the passage here, they come to Jesus who is fast asleep. The storm has not awakened them, awakened him rather. And they say, Jesus, wake up. Save us. We are perishing. And his response to them was, why are you afraid? O oh, you of little faith. They had just seen him perform these miracles to display his authority, to display that he is God, isn't just man. And now they're in the midst of this boat and they're afraid they're about to be capsized and drowned. Now these were professional fishermen, a lot of them. So they knew about a storm, but they can't handle this one. So we see here again in this passage, verses 23 through 27, that he is man, because he's asleep, he's exhausted, he's tired, he needed to sleep just like we need to sleep. But he is also equally God. Now that is probably way too much for us to begin to fathom how that happens, but that's exactly who he is. At this particular point, he has flesh and bone just like we have it, but also he never relinquished his deity. He had to remain God in order to offer us salvation, in order to do what he does in these miracles. He's fast asleep in the midst of this great storm. He stands up, he quiets the storm, and brings it to a great calm. Now, you probably have been in storms or have seen storms at the beach, and you realize that once the storm kind of uh, subsides, that the, it takes a little while for the waves to become calm. Well, it seems like in this account that as soon as Jesus said it, man, it was just crystal clear. It was as calm as it could possibly be. Displaying to them and to us that he has authority even over the weather. And they state there in verse 27, what sort of man is this that even winds and seas obey him? Now, they had seen him heal people, but now they're actually seeing his authority over the weather. Obviously, he was man, he was asleep, he ate, he got tired, he was physically exhausted. But also this man who is God, one who created the weather, who created the climate, was sleeping in the boat in the midst of a violent storm. And the disciples, they were afraid that they were going to die. And so they come crying out to Jesus, you got to help us. And he stands up and he calms everything down. And then they ask that question in verse 27, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? Well, he is God. He is the authority. And so fast forward to us in 2016, why would we not rest in him who has control over the weather? Who can just simply stand up in a boat that is rocking like crazy and tells things to get calm and be quiet in his calm. Why would we not rest in him? Why would we not find our hope in him? The one who controls everything. If he truly has authority over the weather like it states in this account, why wouldn't we rest in him? Why wouldn't we find our hope in him? Why wouldn't we long to be in relationship with him? Why would we not lean into Him for our comfort? Why would we not press into Him, the one who has the authority to calm this raging sea? Why would we not fall into His arms? Maybe it is that we don't know this man. Now, we've been singing these songs this morning, but do we really know Him? Because we really knew him, that he is the Son of Man, but also the Son of God. That we would fall into his arms, resting in his authority. 
So he has authority over the weather. The next one, verses 28 through 34, it tells us that he had authority over demons. Now he gets across the lake finally. After everything's calm, now he meets two demon-possessed men. Now, other gospel accounts, it talks about one. It's the same account, but remember now, they have different eyewitness accounts. So in Matthew, it tells us he saw two demon-possessed men, and they meet him. And notice what they say here. They acknowledge his deity. They automatically acknowledge that he is the Son of God. Now, his disciples didn't get it, but you better believe the demons got it. When Jesus rolls up in there, they know that the authority of God the Father is in their place. And they automatically say, the Son of God is up in here. They acknowledge that. Now the disciples didn't, and oftentimes neither do we acknowledge that the Son of God is with us. But these demons knew that. Why did the demons know that? James chapter 2 verse 19, it reminds us. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Now this is in the midst of the great uh, passage of Scripture, faith without works is dead. But, But James is saying, you know what? I'm glad you believe in God. Good job. Good job. You know who else believes that? The demons believe that. And you know what they do? They actually shudder because he is God. You don't even shudder. They understand the authority of the holy God. Luke chapter 4, verse 41. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. Satan knows who God is. Satan knew that when Jesus came on the scene, that he wasn't just a man. That he actually was God the Father in the flesh. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They knew who Jesus was. And so when these two demon-possessed men, when Jesus gets off that boat and begins to walk there, they automatically greet him and acknowledge him. You are the Son of God. And so they make an interesting request of him. Don't send us to our eternal place of torment. Send us into a herd of pigs. Now what in the world are you talking about? The The eternal place of torment for demons. Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 tells us what's eventually going to happen to Satan one day. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So Satan's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. So you better believe that the demons are going to be right there with him. Praise God! That should excite you, church. That we serve the one who is not only the authority over weather, he is the authority over Satan. And Satan has not won, by the way. Jesus, the Son of God, has won and will always be victorious. Don't send us into our eternal torment. We're not ready for that yet. They knew that's what was going to happen. You know, they had, as they say sometimes, read the back of the book. They knew what was going to happen to them. They said, no, 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 not yet. Please, not yet. Send us into those pigs over there. And so sure enough, Jesus does that. But notice what he says. He says one simple word there in verse 32. And he said to them, go. He didn't write out a long dissertation. He didn't type out a long essay. He didn't do any of that. He just said, go. And they got out of there those two men, and went into those pigs, and the account tells us those pigs then ran off the cliff into the lake or into the sea. Well, you would think that the inhabitants of that city, man, they would be excited. Jesus has shown up here, and he is doing unbelievable things. You would think revival is about to break out, right? That a great awakening is about to occur. Man, Jesus, the Son of God, is here in our presence, has done something we've never, ever seen before. We're going to come out and worship him and fall on our faces before him. No, 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 no. They didn't do that at all. It states here, verse 34, And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. Dear holy God, They had just witnessed the authority of the Son of God. Tear up some demons, say, boys, you're out of here. Go and get in those pigs, and you're gone. 
They had seen these two demon-possessed men, by the way. They didn't want to hang out with them. They had them out way out in the countryside, way away from the inhabitants of the city. So they knew that something great has happened. But they didn't want Jesus to remain there. Jesus has the authority over our greatest enemy, who is Satan. It all started there in Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, God states, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head. That's talking about Jesus taking care of Satan. And you shall bruise his hill. Now, Satan, you will have the opportunity. Jesus will die on the cross. And by the way, you think you're going to be victorious. You think you will. For three days, you think you got this thing done, man. But oh, by the way, you haven't. Because he eventually is going to come back to life. And then eventually, after he goes back into heaven, and then when he returns for the church, eventually you are going to be thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. So he has authority over our greatest enemy, which is Satan. Jesus would be ultimately victorious over Satan through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He defeated our greatest enemy. We should be excited about that. <laughs> we really should. That's, that's a wonderful thing, church. It is. It really is. It's a wonderful thing. It's an awesome thing. Satan, his demons, they recognize Jesus for who he is. Too bad some of us don't. Me included. Man, they automatically knew when Jesus showed up on the scene, that's the Son of God. Oftentimes we don't, right? Man, we do church every Sunday. We sing these songs. We give some money. We listen to, to the preacher talk a little bit. Good deal. I did my church thing. You know what? If the Son of God sometimes showed up here, I'm not sure many of us will even know it. But you know what he does? He dies. For those of us who are truly followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, every time we get together, the Son of God is here because He inhabits us. He indwells in us because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And that should excite us. That should get us going for this next horrible week we got to go face. It shouldn't be horrible when we show up here. It should be a joy. It should be a celebration. It should be, thank you! Thank you! Why would we not rest in the one who has authority over Satan? To use one word, go, and they're gone. Why would we not rest in him? Why would we try to find our rest in everything else? Money, alcohol, drugs, sports, work, family. Why would we try to find our rest in that? When we say that we celebrate the one that simply told those demons, go and they were gone. Man, I think that's logical. We should find our rest in him, right? We should. And we need to help each other to remind one another of that during the week. I need you to remind me of that as well, okay? I don't have this down either. I don't want you to think I do. But we should find our rest in Him who is in control of the weather, but also in control of the demons. Why should we not follow Him? Why would we be much like the inhabitants of this region? Jesus, we don't want you here. You cause too many problems. You turn everything upside down. You bring too much change. Jesus, you're not welcome here. And you say, well, preacher, we would never do that. Really? But be careful now. I'm guessing there are times in each one of our lives, probably even this past week, Jesus, I appreciate it. I appreciate reading about you, Vacation Bible School, those songs, the Kumbaya deal. That's really good, but I don't really need you this week. I got this thing figured out. And Jesus has just done an unbelievable work and say, no, no just, just leave us alone. Shame on us. Shame on every single one of us, me included. He has the authority over the weather, right? That's what the Word said. He has the authority over the demons. Why in the world would we not rest in Him and find our hope in Him? Why would we not follow Him when He teaches us, when He guides us, when He loves us, when He equips us? Why would we not follow Him to make other disciples for Him? Why would we not do that? 
Then we see again in a passage that Dr. Ezel talked about a couple of weeks ago from the Gospel of Mark, but the authority over sickness in verses 1 through 9 of chapter 9. Or 1 through 8, rather. And really, the, kind of the crux of that passage there, he asked the question, what is easier to heal someone, tell them to get up and walk, or to forgive sins? Well, I think John MacArthur has a good point here. He says, both are impossible for man. I can't tell anyone to be healed. And I sure can't tell anyone to forgive you of your sins. I, have not, I don't have that power, neither do you. Only God has that power to tell anyone to get up and walk, to be physically healed. And then, better than that, to forgive them of their sins. Only God the Father can do that. So really the question is, uh, it's a very good question, but both are impossible for man. None of us can do that. And none of them could do that. Only the Son of God could do that. But Jesus heals this man so that people would see that he has forgiven his sins. He healed him physically, but also he wanted them to be able to understand that he not only healed him physically, but more importantly, he healed him spiritually. He did forgive him of his sins. Which now he has a spiritual hope. He's no longer going to be spiritually dead. He is a brand new creation through the power of the Lord Jesus. The miracle displayed Jesus' authority over the sickness, but more importantly, his authority over our greatest enemy and that man's greatest enemy, which was sin. Praise the Lord for those four guys who took him up there, right? Dr. Ezell did a great job of that a few weeks ago. I'll let, hopefully you'll remember that. But notice the difference in this crowd here, though, in verse 8. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. They didn't tell Jesus to leave the region, man. They worshiped. They praised him. They brought glory to him. They had just seen an unbelievable miracle. We have the privilege to follow the one who can speak and bring physical healing. He simply spoke, and that guy was healed. How unbelievable is that? More importantly, though, we have the privilege to follow the one who can speak and bring spiritual healing. We did touch on this a little bit last week, but I'm afraid we, we forget this. We focus so much on physical problems, and I get it. I understand it. We all have them. We have family members who are suffering. I understand, and we should pray for them. Please, please, please don't think, I don't think it's important for us to pray for them. It is. But it's so much more important for us to pray for their spiritual health. Because you know what? This guy was healed, but he was still going to die. At some point, he's still going to die. This guy's still not living, by the way. So when we are physically healed, if we are, praise God, and we celebrate him, and we worship him. But you know what? It's just delaying the inevitable. Because every single one of us, we are going to die physically as a result of the curse in Genesis 3. We are. It may give us another 10, 15, 30 years, and that's wonderful and great as long as we're serving God with it. But eventually, we're all going to die. That is the curse of sin. So we should spend a whole lot more time praying for someone's spiritual help. Because you know what eternity is? I can't define it, and neither can you, but it's a really long time. And once you get there, you're not escaping it. You see it. And if you're in hell, you never, ever, 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 ever die. That's what the Bible says. Eternal torment. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. But if you get to heaven, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you celebrate Jesus for all eternity, however long that is. So we should spend a whole lot more time praying for spiritual needs as opposed to physical needs. You know, we can take all the vitamins, all the nutrients, eat the correct diet, get the correct amount of sleep, exercise, but you know what? We're still going to die. Well, preacher, you're just really encouraging today, aren't you? I just want to offer you some honesty, people. Let's be real transparent, okay? And by the way, we should take care of our physical bodies. All throughout the gospel, it talks, or all throughout the New Testament, talks a lot about that. But unfortunately, for some of us, if not many of us, our primary focus is our physical body. It's temporary. We're a little closer to death now than we were when we first walked in here. You said, yep, the more I listen to you, I'm a little closer to death. That's right. <laughs> we're a little closer to death. And if he lets us live to tomorrow, we're a little closer to death then too. It's temporary. But our spiritual soul, our soul will exist for all of eternity. And we have the opportunity 
to praise and worship and know the one who has authority over the weather, who has authority over Satan, who has authority over sickness. We have that opportunity. Why? Because we are sinners. Romans 3.23, Isaiah 53.6. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. A-L-L, small word, but a huge meaning. Everybody, all seven plus billion people who inhabit this planet, every single one of them, all sinners. Praise God, though, that he came to solve our great problem. And some of us still have that problem, by the way. We don't think we do, but we do. Oh, well, preacher, my name's on the First Baptist Church roll. Good. Ain't getting you to heaven. Or my name's on the roll of my church back home. You know, I'm here at college now, but my, my name's on that roll. Good, great. It's good community. It's not getting you to heaven. Or my name's on a roll of some other church in this town. Because I'm just visiting today. I'm not visiting anymore after you, but it's on that roll. Good. It's not getting you to heaven. Only, only the blood of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of his, not his sins, my sins. He never sinned, by the way. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, that would have been really bad. The forgiveness of my sins that he did when he died on the cross, my substitute. That's the only way I get to heaven. Well, preacher, you should be able to get to heaven just because you went to seminary. No, I don't get there any better than you if I came to church every single day like you did. No, the only way is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ because we're all sinners. And we have to repent of our sin and acknowledge our sin and trust in Him and, and rely on Him and receive the forgiveness that only comes from Him. Have we acknowledged our sin? The one who has the authority over Satan, who has authority over sickness, who has authority over the weather. Have we acknowledged our sin? Because we must. We must trust in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That's exactly who He was and who He is. And when that happens, when we trust in Him, worship happens. You say, well, I don't like to sing songs. When you get saved, if you're really saved, you're going to start singing, all right? That's what you're going to do in heaven. I hate to burst your bubble. You're going to do a lot of it in heaven. You might as well get used to it now. A lot of singing. But that's not just the only part of worship. Worship encompasses so much more. Serving God, honoring God, being obedient to God. But Jesus desires more worshipers of Him. But we cannot worship Him if we don't know Him. If He is not our Lord and Savior, we can't worship Him. You can sing every song in the hymn book or the latest and greatest uh, contemporary song. If you don't know Him, you're just saying a bunch of words. You must know Him. Then finally, we see here in verses 9 through 13 of chapter 9, he has authority over sin. He calls Matthew a hated tax collector to follow him. Man, it's two words. Follow me. Follow me, that's what he tells him. You know what Matthew did? He kind of him hauled around. Ah, nah, no, I don't think so today. Maybe about three weeks from now, I'll do that. No, he dropped everything. This guy was rich, wealthy rich, filthy rich, because he was ripping people off, and people hated his guts. But Jesus Christ says, follow me, and he did. He left it. All of it. And then the next thing we see in this little passage, man, he throws a big old party for all his lost friends. I'm not going to ask that question. Yeah, I will. I'll go ahead and ask it. How many of us have any lost friends? I see one hand, a couple of hands, four or five hands. Good. The problem is, when most of us who've been in church for, oh, I don't know, five plus years or more, we don't have any lost friends. Why? Because we hang out with church folks. Don't get it wrong. I want you to hang out with church people, okay? But if we have no lost friends, no lost acquaintances, notice what Jesus states there in verse 13. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. How many of us really know a sinner? Well, well, preacher, I'm a sinner. Yeah, you're right. You are, and I am too. But how many of us really know a really, 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 really bad sinner? One who's never heard anything about Jesus Christ. How many of us know that sinner? Well, I can't hang out with them. Yes, we should. Now, we shouldn't do what they do. But notice what Matthew does. The only people who knew were lost people. So he said, man, let's throw a big old party. And Jesus came in there and started just teaching, sharing about himself. Praise God. 
Now, Jesus was always, you know, they, they would even say here, why does he hang out with the sinners? That's the reason Jesus would state there in verse 13, I came for the sinners. Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. By the way, that means all of us at one point in our lives. We better be glad that he came to seek and save those who are lost. Because if not, none of us have any hope. The power of Jesus' words changed the lives of many people. He forgave Matthew, and then he, then he met with the countless lost people that Matthew brought into the house. And his words are meant to change us forever in the lives of countless people around us. It was 15 years old. I was 15 years old when I became a Christian. Unfortunately, I don't know a lot of lost people. And I'll be just transparent with you. Why? Because I hang out with a lot of you. You, are, you guys are great. I don't know a lot, a lot of lost folks. I have to be intentional about it, just as you have to be intentional about it. If Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost, then that means we're supposed to do it as well. We can't save them, only Jesus can, but we are to proclaim the gospel to them. Who are the lost people? Everyone. Those who do not know Jesus Christ, they are considered lost. Once we are saved, we need to make sure our circles of influence hear about the authority of Jesus Christ. He has the authority over the weather. He has authority over Satan. He has authority over the sickness. He has authority over sin. How are we doing with this command to get lost people where they can hear about Jesus? Well, preacher, we can't have lost people in the church. Why not? Wouldn't it be great if we had just a bunch of lost people here next Sunday morning? It'd look a little different. It would really be a good thing, church, I promise you. It would be a great thing. Now, they wouldn't know when to stand. They wouldn't know what this little offering plate thing is. They might want to try to get something out of it, you know. You might just have to, no, we don't do that, okay. I'll give you something later if you really need it. But don't take it out. Wouldn't it be great if next week there were a bunch of lost folks here? It would be. be a great thing. It would change things. It would make some of us a little uncomfortable. It would be a little awkward. But you know what? I can't get away from verse 13 of Matthew 9. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I'm not sure how you can get away from that one. Do we know the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we know the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we know what he did for our sins. Do we, me, you, do we know? Have we received the forgiveness of our sins? Are we spiritually alive through him, as Paul told us in Ephesians chapter 2, that he has made us alive in Jesus Christ? If so, are we worshiping him? That's what these folks did. They worshiped. Man, when Jesus healed that guy, they worshiped. They glorified him. Are we discipling others if we're truly followers of him? Are we telling lost people about him? Well, preacher, I don't know any. Then when we get time to come pray in a moment, that should be our prayer. God put a lost person in my path this week. But may I encourage you with this or maybe warn you. If you really pray that prayer, God's going to do it then we have to be obedient to share about the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we proclaiming his authority to our neighbors, our co-workers, our classmates, our buddies? Are we? Jesus' authority impacts us every time we are exposed to the Word of God and we sit under the Word of God. His authority impacts me and changes me every time I open this book. And it does yours too. He and his authority has impacted us this morning. Now to the extent, we'll see what happens with that in the next few weeks. As we leave here and do life. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your authority. Thank you for the hope that only comes from you. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins that only you can forgive through your precious blood. Thank you that you have the authority over nature. You have authority over Satan. You have authority over the illnesses. You have authority over sin. And you simply spoke the word and it happened. 
So this morning, Father, you are speaking the word of salvation to a heart in this room. And if that person would acknowledge and repent of their sin, would acknowledge that you are the Son of God, would acknowledge that you are the Lord and the Savior, the Redeemer of mankind, and they would call on your name, the Bible says they will be saved. And then they would begin the process of learning about your authority. Being discipled by someone in this congregation. Being equipped in a Sunday school class. And then the process of telling others about you would ensue. Father, for that person, I pray that they would be bold enough in a few moments to come and publicly profess you. Not walking down this aisle saves them, it doesn't. Only you save. But it would be important for them to not be ashamed of you. And it would be important for this local congregation to begin the process of discipleship. So Lord, for that one soul today who you've saved, as we sing in a moment, I pray that they would come on the very first word. But then, Father, for those of us who are your followers, but we don't know any lost people, we don't know a single one. Father, I pray this altar is full. And I pray that we would ask you, God, place someone on my heart right now that I need to share about your authority. Father, convict us to do that. And we know you'll equip us to actually follow through. Thank you, Father, for your power. We love you and we ask these things in your name. Amen.